Hello and welcome back to Historical Geology. Today I want to cover chapter one, which is a dynamic and evolving Earth. And in this chapter, we're going to first think about, you know, this changing planet. Really, dynamic means changing. And you'll see we're going to look at this, the look at it in terms of atmospheres, oceans, plate tectonics, and geologic time. And the three themes that run through this through this textbook are plate tectonics. Plate tectonics really is a driving uh, um, idea, the theory behind, and it really explains much of what we see here on Earth's surface. We'll, we'll look at how life has changed through time in terms of organic evolution, and really this concept of deep time. It's, it's really, uh, you know, for many students and for myself even, it's kind of hard to grasp uh, the length of geologic time. Uh, we think in thousands of years being ancient time, but really you need to start thinking of, of millions of years. Now let's go back to this dynamic part here. One of the things I want to point out here is that uh, the dynamic planet has is driven by really two heat engines. The external heat engine is what's going to, it's, it's, it's really driven by solar radiation, the sun, right? So the sun is adding heat and that sun is going to give energy and really we're going to drive into this this atmosphere and ocean circulation right so what so both of these there's a circulation so that circulation is going to drive weather patterns climate and weather for the atmosphere and ocean currents right so that's the external heat engine the second heat engine is the internal heat and this internal heat engine is driven by radioactivity heat within earth and you'll see most of the heat we're seeing from earth is radioactivity the spontaneous decay of an unstable nucleide uh, into a more stable product. And in that process, it's giving off heat. Some of that internal heat engine is also driven by some residual heat left over from when planet Earth formed. Today, today we're going to talk about gravitational differentiation or a separation of components within the Earth where the denser material sunk, sinks to form the core, primarily iron and nickel, and lighter materials rise to form the crust and mantle. Um, so the internal heat engine is really what's driving plate tectonics. So we have two heat, en heat engines. One, the external. The second, the internal heat engine. Now, again, we're going to have, uh, in this Earth system, we're going to have um, uh, several interacting subsystems or components. And really, uh, uh, the word we should probably use here is uh, um, uh, interconnected. So these Earth systems are interconnected, uh, and each will influence the other. Uh, in terms of the atmosphere, uh, we have the gases around the planet. For, for the, the atmosphere, one of our first labs that we'll do is looking at how the atmosphere has changed through time. So that, again, an evolution, a change uh, through time. You'll see that about 4.5 billion years ago, so whenever you see this, this GA, it means billion, because uh, it, it really means giga, and giga is 1 times 10 to the 9, which is a billion, right, years. So 4.5 billion years ago, you'll see that, that greater than 80% of our atmosphere was carbon dioxide. And then obviously today, we have very little, although we have it in the parts per million, and it's, an, it's a, a greenhouse gas, and little changes in that can trap that that infrared radiation trapping that heat. But but today, our atmosphere, if we go back, to, if we go to today, we'll see that uh, most of our atmosphere, about 78% of it is, is nitrogen, nitrogen gas, N2. Uh, about 21% is oxygen, free oxygen, and it's a molecule which is O2, that's what we can breathe. And then, um, and that makes basically 99%. That means that 1% is is other one percent is other and that includes carbon dioxide um, uh, methane gas uh, argon gas right so that's our atmosphere today uh, and so obviously changes in that will affect uh, the biosphere uh, the hydrosphere is the oceans and a subset of the hydrosphere is the cryosphere which are the glaciers just one thing to note is um, the oceans are immense they cover about 331 million square kilometers so a huge area about 71% of Earth's surface. But if we took all the ocean water, all the fresh water we have on Earth, and made a sphere out of that, we'd see that that sphere 
would have a diameter of about 860 miles, which is 1380 kilometers. So really it's not as big as we think it is, um, uh, but it's an, an important resource. And of that water, you'll see that 97.5% is salt water or saline and two and a half is fresh water. And the majority of that fresh water, uh, about 68.7% about of it lies in glaciers and 30% is in groundwater. So you can see why groundwater is such an important resource for our drinking water. And you can see a very small percentage, about less than 1% is in rivers and lakes and whatnot, right? So you'll see that groundwater is super important for us. All right, then um, the other sphere is the geosphere. The geosphere is solid earth and it, it includes uh, the tectonic plates. So whenever you see this word lithosphere, we're talking about tectonic plates. So remember, lithos is a Greek word which means stone, so the stony sphere of earth. Then we have the mantle, which comprises most of earth. It's about 82% it's about of the volume of earth. It's the largest portion of earth. And then the core, which is primarily iron and nickel metal. Geology, we we just don't study planet Earth, but we study all materials, which include uh, um, comets, asteroids, other planets, moons, right? There, there are two components to the geology. We look at physical geology, which deals with uh, minerals, rocks, um, the processes like seafloor spreading, uh, erosion by rivers and glaciers, landslides, uh, how groundwater percolates in the subsurface. So all these are kind of processes that operate on or in Earth and the materials that they produce. Second part in the focus of this class is historical geology. And this one is looking at, at uh, uh, how Earth formed. In fact, today we're going to talk about how Earth formed and really have to go back to, how, to the Big Bang and how we're getting uh, chemical elements like carbon, oxygen, silicon to form minerals, right? Where did they come from? So we'll talk about um, uh, uh, nuclear fusion and stars and, and supernova. Um, and then we'll talk about how the atmosphere, how the oceans uh, form the continents, how they change through time, and how life has evolved and changed through time. And obviously geologists, uh, uh, we also look for mineral and energy resources. We try to solve environmental problems. One eminent problem that's coming up here is the, the changing climate leading to changing sea levels more intense storm activity, um, and also we look at natural disasters like volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, landslides. Now when we look at um, science, we want to think of the scientific method, right? And so uh, you'll, you'll hear, hear the word theory, and, and the word theory to a scientist is, 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 a, is, is different than, than what non-scientists would think of theory. So to a non-scientist, um, a, a theory may be just a hypothesis, right? So a scientist would, would say a hypothesis has not been tested yet. It needs to go the, undergo the rigors of observation, laboratory experiments, and, and really to test to see if, if the prediction is made true. And so um, uh, uh, a, a theory is, is a testable, testable explanation of something that you observe, right? And you have supporting evidence. Um, but the other key thing about a theory is that it makes a prediction. And those predictions, you can go out and test for those predictions. In fact, one of the predictions we look at is we look at this, this um, uh, idea of seafloor spreading, right? So, so, uh, and so plate tectonics, we're going to have a new seafloor forming at these mid-oceanic ridges, right? So we call these divergent plate boundaries. And then as we move away from that mid-oceanic ridge, the seafloor should get older in both directions. And so that's the plate tectonic theory, and that's a testable. So the prediction is if we drill or look for fossils farther from the ridge, they should get older, right? If we go to the mid-oceanic ridge, we should see volcanoes and lava pouring out of the seafloor. And sure enough, that's what we see. We see um, volcanoes and new seafloor forming at the ridge. And then as we go farther from the ridge, we see that the seafloor is getting older and older as the farther away you get from this mid-oceanic ridge. <clears throat> so anyways, that's um, a little bit about the scientific method. Um, now we'll look at the origin of the universe and Earth's place in the cosmos. Remember, the cosmos is the study of stars, galaxies, deep space, planetary planets, everything that's in the cosmos. In fact, Earth is part of the cosmos, right? So this... Um, uh, so the idea here is the Big Bang, right? We're going to look at the Big Bang Theory, 
And the Big Bang Theory really describes the, the origin of the universe. And if we look at how rapidly distant galaxies are expanding from us uh, in this Big Bang um, uh, Theory, we see that the most distant galaxies uh, traveling incredibly fast speeds, if we could bring them all back to one point, uh, it would take about 13.7 billion years, right? So that's about how old the universe is. The universe has no edge, no center. Um, if people wonder what, you know, what existed before the universe. Well, there was no, there was nothing, right? So if we think about relativity, you, you can't have time without space. And really the Big Bang, this, this inflation event, this formation of space, that's when time started, right? So you cannot have time um, uh, unless you have space. So that's really part of the space-time continuum. So um, this idea of singularity, that's really the, the premise to the Big Bang is that, that all matter in the, in the universe was at one geometric point. And this one geometric point was incredibly dense, incredibly hot. And then um, uh, there was an inflation event that, that expanded the universe and, and it has cooled enough to where, where chemical elements are formed and eventually stars and galaxies form. And then we get heavy atom objects that form and eventually we get planets that form, right? So there are two lines of evidence for the Big Bang. Right, so let's look over here. So the two lines of evidence we'll, we'll see for the Big Bang is one, we see the, this, this idea of the redshift. And two is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So it's this pervasive radiation that occurs, it occurs at about maybe 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. And absolute zero is zero Kelvin, which is negative 2, 273 degrees uh, centigrade, right? Um, so basically, remember, at absolute zero, there's no kinetic energy. All, uh, even in rocks and minerals and ice, it, it may be frozen or solid, the molecules are still vibrating. They have kinetic energy. But once you get to absolute zero, uh, which is zero degrees Kelvin, uh, we're, we're going to, all that kinetic energy stops, right? So everywhere we look in the universe, we still see that thermal energy, right? And that thermal energy is this microwave background radiation, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So those are the two li lines of evidence we use for the Big Bang. So um, let's take a look at, at this in a little bit more detail. One of the things we look at uh, in terms of this redshift, so we're looking at, at the, the spectra from stars. And we know that stars are primarily composed of hydrogen. They use hydrogen as a fuel uh, to to make energy and we feel the solar radiation and so this electromagnetic magnetic spectrum we, we need to think about and think about it in terms so the electromagnetic spectrum we need to think about it in terms of, of of the colors of the rainbow you've probably heard of this there's the 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 acronym we use is Roy G Biv right Roy G Biv and Roy G Biv just are, are the colors of the rainbow so this would be Red, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And we see them right here on this, on this PowerPoint slide. Um, but note that the, the red end of the spectrum, this is going to be the, the, the longer. So these, this light has a little bit longer wavelength than the, the, the blue end, which is a shorter. So remember, uh, uh, light is a form of energy that travels in these waves, right? So we're looking at at the wavelength would be the distance between the crests. So that would be one wavelength right there. But once we go beyond uh, the visible spectrum, you know, there's infrared radiation. So this is that heat that's trapped by, by the greenhouse gases. So there's infrared, there's radio waves. Those are getting really long. When you go to the shorter end of the spectrum, there is a UV light, ultraviolet, right? There's X-rays, gamma rays, so these get really, really uh, small. Uh, so any, so white light coming from stars can be put across a prism and will be dispersed uh, or refracted into the, the, the colors of the rainbow. So let's stop here for now.